Who is the next one? Is Dr. Uh, Dr. Wayne? Okay, thank you, everybody. It is a big pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Wayne from Sao Paulo, Brazil. In my opinion, one of the best Professor Rotom fellows. So he will talk about the Messial Temporal Law. Thank you, Dr. Wen. Um, hello, good morning, everyone. Let me put on my slides, just a second. Can you all see it? Yeah, we can. Can you hear me? So you can hear me. Okay, sure. good morning, everyone in Brazil and um, good evening somewhere else, good afternoon somewhere else in the world. Um, it's an honor for me to be here today with you. And I would like to thank Professors Borba, Luis Felipe, Soriano, Campero, and the Neurosurgical Societies from Latin America, from Mexico, Argentina, and from Brazil. My topic today is the media temporal lobe anatomy. And I will always like to, to use the application to show you the application of the anatomical knowledge in surgeries. So uh, I will give to you today what I've learned, the lessons I have learned in the last um, about a little bit more than 500 cases of surgeries involved in this area. Uh, my mentors, you all know Dr. Roden and also Dr. Evandro, they have influenced tremendously my career <clears throat> and my life. This is our course in the United States. You can see um, Vicent, you can see um, uh, other, just a second, let me see here. Pablo Rubino here. And then here's our team in Sao Paulo. This one is a um, Mateus. This is a Brazilian Spanish called Vicente. We have Vanessa and a Taiwanese Brazilian, which is me and uh, our boss, Dr. Evandro de Oliveira. And we give courses in Sao Paulo in the United States. This one is, was in Taiwan and uh, in Portugal in a regular basis. Mesotemporal temporal lobe. Because of the time, I will give you only the key anatomical landmarks that I, that I think is absolutely important in, the, in our surgery. We are talking about this region. Dr. Matias, have, he has given a brilliant lecture about this area. So we're gonna talk specifically about this area today. So we have the parahippocampal gyrus, a hook, which is uncus, and we have to see what's inside the ventricle, what's outside the ventricle. I will give you many, throughout the, the, my lecture, I'll give you many, many take home messages. So you have to memorize at least I will suggest you to memorize these uh, take home messages only, okay? The first take home message is, is that a temporal horn is, is projected onto the surface, onto the middle temporal gyrus, okay? This is a very important thing. And also the temporal horn does not start at the tip of temporal lobe. It starts about two and a half centimeters to three centimeters behind the tip of the temporal uh, lobe. So the first take home message, the temporal horn is projected onto the middle temporal gyrus. Um, when we talk about uh, mesotemporal lobe, because we want to do surgeries in this area, and I have realized over the years that it's very important to know what structures are located outside the ventricle, what structures are located inside the ventricle, and what are the surrounding uh, structures uh, around this area? And we ha will have to try to correlate, for instance, what is the relationship of anterior choroidal artery to the hippocampus? What is the relationship of the third nerve to the uncus and so on? The first thing we're gonna talk is about the extraventricular structure, which is uncus. Uncus means hook and then Uncus, if we can make analogy, Uncus present an anterior segment, a posterior segment. And here below the posterior segment of the Uncus is the um, parahippocampal gyrus. Between them, between the anterior and posterior segment, we have this apex. 
this one. This is apex of the uncus. If we turn, we look from the basal surface of the brain, and we can see here is the uncal notch or the hippocampus sulcus that separates the under surface of the posterior segment of the uncus to the parahippocampal gyrus. So we have made this dissection over here of the, my left, my left side, but the right side of the, the brain, we, in which we have removed the parahippocampal gyrus. And then we can see what's going on on the under surface of the posterior segment. We have this little gyri, this uh, little gyri here, 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 here. The first uncinate gyrus, second is bend of Giacomini, and the third one, the last one, just before the inferior choroidal point is the intralimbic. I can see this in surgery. This little gy the, the, all this little gyri are representation of the external hippocampal digitations. And now, so we are looking from below up, from the down to the top, we can see that after the parahippocampal gyrus, if we look above, it's gonna be the dentate gyrus, and then it's gonna be above the dentate gyrus, it's gonna be fornix, finger of the fornix. And then above the finger of the fornix, it's gonna be the choroidal fissure, which is the fissure between the fornix and the thalamus. And here we can see a nice view of the lateral geniculate body. That means that the lateral geniculate body is located above and just a little behind the inferior choroidal point, which is the beginning of the choroidal fissure in the temporal horn, okay? Take home message from Uncas. Uncas present anterior segment, which is the anterior medial surface. Uncas present an apex, and also Uncas presents a posterior segment. That present two surfaces. One is the posterior medial surface, and one is the inferior surface. And between, between them, it's going to be what? Between the hippocampal, uh, the under surface of the posterior segment of the uncus and the parahippocampal gyrus, it's going to be a sulcus called uncal notch or hippocampus sulcus. Structures located inside the ventricle. We have the hippocampus, which is the medial part of the floor of the temporal horn, okay? And the hippocampus present a head, is hidden here, where I don't see it in this view. And we, can, we have the body, which is, starts at the level of the inferior cradle point. So that means that in the head of hippocampus, there's no cradle plexus. Whereas from this point, which is the inferior cradle point, posteriorly, it's gonna be cradle fissure, and this is the beginning of the body of the hippocampus. Hippocampus means seahorse. And then curving medially, this is gonna be the tail of the hippocampus. And it's gonna be fusing, getting together with the medial wall of the atrium, specifically calcaravis, okay? And we have this lateral view. This is the inferior choroidal point. The, the red dot is the inferior choroidal at the entrance of the inferior choroidal artery inside the temporal horn. And here the, the blue dot is the inferior ventricular vein exiting from the roof of a temporal horn towards the basal vein. So, and this cap, Napoleon's cap, is the lateral genicular body that belongs to the thalamus, okay? So on this point, anteriorly, this is gonna be head of hippocampus. No cradle plexus over here. From this point, posteriorly, it's gonna be the uh, choroidal fissure is a fimbria. It's gonna be the body of the hippocampus. And then more posteriorly, it's gonna be the tail that fuses with the calcaravis and, and with the, um, the bulb of the callosum, okay? From surgical viewpoint, the hippocampus ends up here. But from functional viewpoint, the circuit will continue anteriorly. And this is a very uh, important uh, slide of my presentation. This is view from above, from top down, we can see the apex of the uncus, the right side, right temporal horn. This is the anterior segment, 
apex posterior segment. We can see clearly here that the head of hippocampus is completely related to the posterior segment of the uncus. That means what? The posterior segment of the uncus is the head of hippocampus when viewed from the cisternal side. Okay, from, when viewed from the intraventricular side, we call it head of hippocampus. When viewed from cisternal side, we call it posterior segment. Okay, but they are the same thing. Okay, and here we have the inferior choroidal point. We have the finger of the fornix. Okay, we have the beginning of the choroidal fissure. The choroidal fissure grows from the inferior choroidal point through uh, through the atrium body of the and then to the foramen of Monroe. And and here we can see the tail of hippocampus joining the medial wall of the atrium. Take home message from Uncas. Anterior segment equals amygdala. Posterior segment equals head of hippocampus. Another intraventricular structure, amygdala. Amygdala, we're talking about temporal amygdala, okay? Because the concept of extended amygdala system is much larger than this. We're talking about temporal amygdala. You can see from this section of the brain, here's the head of hippocampus, here's the cavity of the temporal horn, and you can see here a, a gray matter stuff round area uh, uh, nucleus here, nuclei, which is amygdala. So what we can tell from this slide, the amygdala is located ahead of the head of hippocampus, or the amygdala is actually the anterior wall of the temporal horn. Take home message, amygdala is the anterior wall of the temporal horn. Here we have another coronal cut okay, at the level of the optic tract in which we can see here, it is a close up view. We can see here is the head of hippocampus and here is a, a gray matter structure located on top of the head of hippocampus and also fused superiorly with the globus pallidus. You can see the color here is the pale and here is much darker. So this is globus pallidus. This is, and this is amygdala. This is head of hippocampus. And then people would tell, will ask me, wait, wait a minute, when you just told you just told us that the amygdala is located ahead of head of hippocampus. Now you are talking that amygdala is located above the head of hippocampus. So what is that? I want, I was, I, what I'm trying to tell you is amygdala is located ahead and on top of the head of hippocampus. And also you can see there's no, they're fused. Amygdala is fused superiorly with the globus pallidus. So how can I perform the amygdala hippocampectomy sparing? I want to remove this part of the amygdala below. I don't want to injure the globus pallidus. So what would be the best landmark? You can tell here, there's no sulcus, no fissure or nothing that separate them. But we can tell that this is the uh, optic tract. So optic tract is a very good landmark for you to judge how high can you go. You can go as high as where the optic tract is located. You cannot go higher, otherwise, during the amygdala hippocompactomy resection of the amygdala, you can injure the globus pallidus. We are studying, we are about to publish a paper in which I don't want to see, for instance, I would do subpeal resection. I don't want to see the optic tract. Every time we open a cistern in this area, there's gonna be a bunch of perforators and, and they, be, they can be endangered by opening the cistern. If I keep I can keep the arachnoid membrane. I can make my surgery safer. I can skip, I can save the perforators. I don't have to touch them. So what, are, what areas are covered by the arachnoid membrane? We are studying this recess. We have named this optic uncle recess. We follow, we follow the arachnoid membrane up to here. And when it disappears and reflect like this, we know that we have reached about the height the, the level of optic tract. Take home message, amygdala is the anterior wall of the temporal horn, we know. Amygdala stays on top of the head of hippocampus. 
An optic tract is a good landmark to separate globus pallidus below, uh, above, from amygdala, from the amygdala below. And then we have this next cut. We are looking from below up. And we, in which we have the optic tract, interperforated substance, amygdala, right now in cesura, insular pole. So we can see the relationship between the, the beginning of the choroidal plexus, which is, which is the inferior choroidal point to the amygdala. Amygdala is located ahead, ahead, in front, ahead of the inferior choroidal point, okay? Optic tract, we just saw optic tract separates the amygdala below from the globus pallidus above. But if you cross this region, you will injure the optic tract. You can enter the globus pallidus and then you can maybe injure the upper portion of cruel cerebrum, the peduncle here, you can see. Well, okay. Well, uh -huh. What? Um, and also, you know, frequently the mesotemporal lobe region uh, is involved in insular tumors. So we have, you have, in, you have insular, um, insular tumors that invade the uh, mesotemporal lobe region. So we, it's very important for us to know the relationship between the insular pole and the uncus. So what is the relationship between the insular pole and the uncus? You can see here's the M1. Here's the carotid artery, carotid artery, A1, M1, genu of MCA. If we divide the M1 segment into two halves, the distal and the proximal half, you can see that behind, behind the insular pole, uh, excuse, behind the distal half of MC, M1, is the insular pole. And behind the insular pole, it's gonna be the temporal horn. And, then, and here is the amygdala. Amygdala is located behind the proximal half of the M1. And behind the amygdala is gonna be the head of hippocampus. Meaning insular pole is located a little bit ahead of in relation to the amygdala. And also, Insular pole is located behind and above the M1. Amygdala is located behind and below the, M, the proximal M1. It sounds confusing, but this area is, is really complicated. Uh, but this is a very important um, information, take home message in this part of the anatomy. Amygdala stays behind and below, and below the proximal half of M1. Insular pole stays behind and above the posterior proximal, the, uh, behind, uh, behind above, above the proximal half of M1. This is mistyping. Uh, it's not posterior, it's the proximal, uh, distal. Ins again, insular pole stays behind and above the distal half of M1. Amygdala stays behind and below the proximal. Mistyping here. Please correct the proximal here. Insular pole stays lateral and ahead of the amygdala. And behind the insular pole is the lateral part of a temporal horn cavity. Behind the amygdala is the head of hippocampus. This is a very important anatomical relationship. Internal capsule, both Dr. Kadri, Dr. Stefan, and also uh, a little bit uh, uh, Matthias mentioned about the optic radiation. Here we, I got a Skip this, okay? Uh, Mayer's loop. So basically, optic radiation is part of the roof and mainly the retrolenticular part of the internal capsule, okay? Here's the lentiform nucleus. And here will be the retro behind, retrolenticular part of in, internal capsule. And here's the sub under the lentiform nucleus, so sublenticular part of the internal capsule. Re optic radiation is part of them. And also as, as this is the anterior portion of optic radiation, it's called the uh, Mayer's loop. Take home message. 
Optic radiation constitutes part of the roof and the lateral wall of the temporal horn. Optic radiation is part of a sub and the retrolenticular components of the internal capsule. And Mayer's loop is the anterior part of a temporal horn with a variable extent, can go very anteriorly or not so anteriorly, but it's the anterior part of the optic radiation. What vein drains the mesotemporal lobe region? It's the basal vein. And basal vein presents a striate segment that starts from the veins draining the south side of the insula and will join in this region under the roof of the interperforated substance with the olfactory veins, interocerebral veins, and frontal orbital veins to constitute under, enter, under the interperforated substance into the first segment, which is the striate segment of basal vein. And then at the tip apex of the uncus is going to be the beginning. By joining the peduncular vein, they will start the second segment, which is the peduncular. This is the anterior peduncular segment, and this is the posterior peduncular segment. Between them, this is going to be the inferior ventricular vein joining at the level of the inferior cradle point to divide the peduncular segment into anterior and posterior. At the level of lateral mesencephalic sulcus, it's going to be the posterior mesencephalic segment. Usually, the basal vein will drain toward the vein of Galen, but sometimes it can go to the uh, superior petrosal sinus as well. Uh, there are anatomical variations of uh, drainage pattern of the basal vein. Take home message. Basal vein drains the medial temporal lobe region. And there are three segments, peduncular, uh, striate, peduncular, and posterior mesencephalic segment. Arterial relationships, internal artery, MCA, anterior carotid, posterior cerebral artery. Both M1 and carotid artery are related to the anterior segment of the uncus. We will see that the oculomotor nerve will be, not, not here, will be crossing just below the tip of the apex of the uncus. And the posterior segment, P2A, will be related to the posterior segment um, of the uncus. The P2A segment of the PCA will be related to the posterior segment. Anterior carotid artery. This one is with, from top down, this view. This is a carotid artery. This is A1, M1. This is a PCOM because go posterior immediately to join the P1. This is the anterior carotid artery turning around the uncus to enter the temporal horn through here, the anterior inferior carotid point. This is the lateral view end of the anterior carotid artery entering the inferior carotid point here. You can tell by, by see, looking at this slide that the inferior carotid point, this is uncus, a medial view of the uncus. This is the apex of the uncus. This is the anterior segment. This is a posterior segment. Posterior segment, PCA. Anterior segment, M1, carotid artery. Inferior carotid point, you can see this is the highest, the most superior and most posterior part of the uncus. So if you want to, re to remove the uncus, remove the amygdala, you have to see, identify here. And you have to identify another point over here. What is the most anterior and the highest, most anterior and superior point of the amygdala, I just mentioned that, the optic level of the optic tract. But if you want, don't want to see the optic tract, you can use the optic uncle recess, which is here. So if you trace a line, optic uncle recess to the inferior choroidal point, you have reached the level, the separation between the limits between the globus pallidus above, amygdala below. This is angiography, angiographical correlation. This is the anterior choroidary. This is a PCOM, you can see here. And this is probably the entry site inferior choroidal point. And here we can see the choroidal plexus. Here, see, this is a basal view, inferior choroidal point. And now I have a question. You can see, this is the roof of a temporal horn. This is a thalamus. So whenever I, I have to operate on a temporal lobe, a tumor, for instance, how medially can I go? I want to remove this part, but I want to spare this part. 
what would be the best landmark? This is the choroidal plexus, choroidal fissure, separate what's safe to remove, what's unsafe to remove medially. Okay, this is a close up view, inferior choroidal, inferior ventricular vein, choroidal plexus, medially thalamus, laterally temporal lobe structures that you can remove. Take home message inferior choroidal point is the most superior and the posterior part of the uncus. Choroidal fissure separates the thalamus from the fornix. Okay. Arteries. Look at here. This is a posterior cerebral artery. This branch goes underneath the dentate gyrus. The same, the same trunk originated another branch that goes between the fornix and the thalamus. This one is the lateral posterior choroidal artery. This one's a hippocampal artery. This one has to be sacrificed to cut and coagulate and cut during the mesotemporal lobe removal. This one has to be preserved. Take home message. Lateral posterior choroidal arteries enter the choroidal fissure. Hippocampal arteries enter the hippocampal sulcus between the dentate above and the parahippocampal gyrus below. This is how we view left side, left hippocampus, hippocampal vessels entering the hippocampal sulcus. We have to collect, uh, co co coagulate and, and section, cut them. And you can see here, once again, arachnoid carrying, arachnoid of the hippocampal sulcus carrying the hippocampal vessels. Another important landmark, the third nerve passes, courses below the tip of hippocampus, tip of the uncus. This is a view from above, tip of Duncus, third nerve passes below. Take home message of oculomotor nerve courses below the apex of Duncus. There are many, many different ways to approach the mesotemporal lobe from the transylvian, trans superior temporal, trans middle temporal gyrus, from below, and now have super cerebellar infratentorial. The bottom line is you have to get inside the ventricle. Once you're inside the ventricle, the procedure is almost the same. So how can I get into the ventricle? I can, you can see all the basal uh, temporal sulci are pointing toward the lateral part of the roof of lateral part of the cavity of a temporal horn. So if I, if, if I can go straight, it's okay. If I can miss on purpose, I can hit here and they go immediately. This is a occipital uh, temporal sulcus, okay? So we can use this take home message. Collateral and occipital temporal sulci point toward the collateral eminence. But you cannot aim that sulcus too posteriorly. You have to aim, you have, if, want, you, if you want to hit the ventricle from transylvian, you have to go be behind the genu of MCA. If you go ahead of genu of NCA, you're gonna hit the amygdala. You have to go from here to hit the ventricle. So you have to look at the genu of MCA. Take home message, intracellular approach deepen from the inferior limiting sulc of the insula, posterior to the genu of MCA to reach the temporal horn. Okay, lots of talks about anatomy. Now I have about um, five to six minutes to talk about surgery. This is a positioning that we, I use for enter um, circulation aneurysm. You see the positioning is different, more rotation, deflection, extension of the neck. This is the ex normal exposure for um, enter circulation aneurysm. This is uh, for mesotemporal lobe region. And um, I'm gonna skip this, skip this. Oh. Just a second. Mm. I'll wait my for my. Maybe we'll come back up soon. But um, this is what I I've dissected after you know the removal of the mesotemporal lobe region. So if you are sure. Did, did, I uh, did I remove the mesotemporal region? You'll be sure if I see the carotid artery, third nerve, basilar. You don't have to always to see basilar, but we know basilar is here. This is a PCA. You always see PCA. You have to see the 
cerebral peduncle. Sometimes we see the, the fourth, sometimes we see the pons, sometimes we see the basal vein. We always see the inferior choroidal point. And let me see, try now again. Okay. So um, let's see. We'll start at uh, four minutes and 50 seconds. So we are inside the ventricle. This is a right side, right hippocampus, right amygdala. Now I'm just Wait. exposing seeing. We are not seeing the video. You don't see the video? No. Oh, sorry. No. Let, me, let me see. Um, I have to share again, maybe. Yeah, it's, it's the other screen, probably, because uh, we are just seeing the Gero, Geral Barra Videos Editados 2017. Oh. Maybe, Dr. Wen, when you press uh, share screen, compartilhar tela, you need to select uh, yeah, uh, whatever is the viewer you are using, like QuickTime viewer. Okay, let's see. Now I'm sharing again. Yeah, when you hit share screen, does it show options? Uh, what uh, software do you want to share? You're sharing screen. Do you see this? Can you yeah. see this? Yeah, let's try yeah, again. PowerPoint. Yeah. And how about this? Mm, no. no. No? If no. you put share screen now, does it uh, show any option to select a QuickTime player or whatever software? You can Let share me see. The other screen. New share. Maybe it will work now. I hope. Can you see? No? no. Still not? Still not. No. That's fine. Okay. But try to exit the PowerPoint. Yeah. Try to exit the full screen PowerPoint. Maybe then. You have to try exiting from the PowerPoint. Okay. Let me. Direct from the. From the. Listen, now, now stop. The the from the video. Yeah. Okay. Stop share. I will exit. You know, this is like um, the live presentation is like in surgery. Sometimes we get in trouble. <laughs> Dr. Wynn, we have 700 neurosurgeons that don't know how to use the computer <laughs> to help you. <laughs> OK. And I, I feel glad now, <laughs> relieved. <laughs> No, I'm not the only one, but it's fine. Let me see here. Um, and I apologize for this. No problem at all. Convenience. Go um, ahead. Just take your time. I'll try. Someone said, uh, try sharing the entire desktop and not a specific window. Yeah. I don't know if you hit uh, share screen, if it has this option, I don't know. Um, well, I am trying, let me see here. Now share the... Um... Yeah, when, uh, can I ask you if this could be, unfortunately the last try because we, we must keep on and you can go ahead, please. Okay. Share desktop one, someone uh, suggested if you hit share yeah. desktop one. Mm. Yeah, because well, when I personally, I press share screen, it shows some options. And the uh -huh. first option is desktop one. And people are saying this desktop one is actually, yeah, you're full. Yeah, 
Now we are going to see it. Can you see it? Not yet. We are seeing no? the explorer window. Mm, well, well, maybe next time. Yeah, That's next fine. Time. Yeah. No problem. Um, well. Um, Can you put the, well, the, the lecture again? I'm if you trying. start the video, Taiwan, <laughs> if you start the video, does it play? No, it's playing for me, but not playing for you guys. Uh, but that's fine. So we have um, more opportunity in the future to talk about this. Se inserir o vídeo de novo na apresentação. Uh, acho que agora vai demorar demais, né? É, eu acho que a gente não tem tempo. Não tem tempo, é, eu estou ocupando o tempo dos outros. Né? Estão uh, vendo alguma coisa ou não? Não. É, é fine. O... It's fine. That's então, fine. Você está usando um, as telas separadas, não? Não, estou usando uma só. É. Ah, tá. Porque às vezes quando faz isso tem que pôr desktop 1, desktop 2. Ah, é? Bom, não faz é. mal. Eu já gastei tempo demais. Né? Eu vou... I spend a lot of your time. I apologize for that. And I try to finalize because we have more um, presentations yet to come. Um, Dá para ver aqui, não? Yes, yeah, we can. So, um, oh, not this one. So to finalize, you know, I I spoke a lot of things. I wish I could show the video to show the anatomy inside the surgery, but because of a technical my ignorance, I don't know the um, <laughs> the software that well. So you don't see the video, but you can see this is um, after the usual resection, and this is. For those who are interested in, um, you know, references for you to read, you can have um, this paper we published back in 1999 about very specific about uh, mesotemporal lobe region and um, uh, applied to the amygdala hippocompactomy in neurosurgery. And we, um, the technique of the, the surgery itself, I had a chance to publish in Japan in 2012. And this is um, the tip of how to use the gray matter, uh, the occipital temporal sulcus to find the ventricles in, in when you're doing amygdala hippocompactomy. And if you're interested in the choroidal fissure, we had a chance to publish this uh, in 1998. It was a, choroidal, a transchoroidal approach. And uh, to see the specific, specific relationship between the insula and the mesotemporal lobe, you can consult this paper about the Sylvan Fissure region published in 2009. And of course, I would definitely recommend you guys to read Dr. Rotem's Cranial Anatomy and Surgical Approaches book. And um, if you had time, the last three editions of Humans, we had a chance to, to publish, to write the Surgical Anatomy of the Brain. And um, the last take home message, you guys, please stay safe. Uh, have a wonderful weekend and thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wayne. Uh, I can assure you that this video problem was not a problem at all for your wonderful lecture. It was a very nice lecture. Congratulations. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and now we move forward uh, to the last talk. Of